Hello, hello, hello. Can everyone hear me okay? Great, fantastic. Um, well, my name is Peter Smart. Uh, this is uh, Rob Hawkes, uh, and we're here to talk to you today about Visi Cities. Um, so, just want to start off with a few uh, introductions. Can everyone hear me okay over the, vo the volume of these other stages? Yeah? Okay, great. <laughs> uh, so I just want to start off with a few introductions. So my name is Peter Smart, uh, and I'm a designer. Uh, and I help global organizations innovate. Um, so um, I have contributed to two books on design. I regularly write um, on user experience design and best practice, uh, and have won uh, as a top industry awards. Uh, I also recently traveled 2,500 miles around Europe to try and solve 50 problems in 50 days using design. That's a project and I get to speak about all over the world. Uh, and this is Rob. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. Yeah, so my name's Rob. I'm a digital tinkerer, which basically means I play with uh, new and interesting technologies. Um, I'm a former technical evangelist at Mozilla, so I was sort of traveling the world talking to people about JavaScript and web technologies and games and things like that. Uh, author of a couple of technical books on HTML5. Um, and yeah, that's pretty, much, that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Brilliant. Okay, so uh, we're here today to talk to you or introduce you um, to Visi Cities um, and uh, equally the, the amazing technologies that are making it all possible and hopefully inspire you guys to go away and actually have a look at uh, some of these technologies. So we're going to start off with a, a brief kind of just uh, brief introduction to the project um, uh, and some of the technologies that we're using uh, before moving on to uh, some of the lessons that we've learned along the way and that will hopefully benefit you guys as you start to look into uh, these technologies. Um, and then finally, we'll kind of round up with uh, what's next uh, for the platform. So by way of giving uh, a project overview uh, and by, by a show of hands, who here has played SimCity or have ever heard of the game SimCity? Yeah? <laughs> Isn't it amazing? Yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, so for those of you who haven't heard of SimCity, uh, SimCity is a game um, that lets you build uh, imaginary uh, cities. Uh, and as the mayor of your city, you're able to see things in your city like um, transport and pollution and crime. Uh, and Rob and I were playing on SimCities uh, a matter of months ago. And we just thought to ourselves, wow, wouldn't it be amazing if we could try and make this for real life? Uh, so that's where the project started. Um, so from very, very humble beginnings, um, we are actually now talking to uh, governments and organizations all over the world about how we can use what we've created uh, to help them um, make better decisions and see their data um, in completely new ways. Um, so Rob and I started building this in my front room uh, <laughs> back in March um, and we were um, hacking and researching uh, and we discovered uh, two uh, amazing things. The first uh, is that cities are absolutely awesome. About 60% of us in the world, 60% of the, the world's population live in cities. Um, cities are the world's centers for innovation, for uh, commerce, for technology, and for culture. Uh, and they're built on incredible, uh, incredibly beautiful, complex systems that we all take for granted every day. Things like sanitation, things like transport, things like electricity. Um, and so the more we, we got to know uh, cities, the more we were just absolutely amazed. Um, and the, the fact is that as our population grows, more and more of us will actually start to uh, live in cities. Therefore, understanding how we can better understand, uh, manage, uh, run, and build for these cities is fundamental to human advancement. The second thing we realized is that the web is full of amazing free data. Um, so we are literally swimming in it. Here in the UK, um, we alone, we have massive organizations who are pumping out incredible sources of information. This, uh, this data um, isn't just uh, abstract data, it's actually incredibly useful um, and it actually uh, tells incredible stories about the world that we live in. Um, so we have, we, we have information accessible on things like um, the quality of our children's education, on pollution, on crime in 
our cities on transport. Um, so here in the UK, for example, we have things like uh, police.uk. Uh, we also have um, uh, open street map, uh, ordnance survey. We have census.gov. And that's just in the UK alone. The list just goes on and on. But around the world, every two days, we produce as much information, as much data as we as humans have done from 2003 backwards to the dawn of mankind. That is amazing. We produce as much in two days as we have done from 2003 back to the dawn of man. That's how much data that you and I are constantly producing all of the time. So what we realized is by looking at cities and looking at this big data, if we could find a way to harness this amazing information and, and combine it using some pretty cutting edge web technologies, we could try to see uh, if we uh, could help people understand the world and the context they live in in completely new ways. So this is how the idea of busy cities came about. Um, but how did we start turning this into reality? And what does it actually allow you to do? So we're using a variety of technologies. Uh, we're using WebGL and FreeGS library specifically for the 3D visualization um, within the browser. We're using a library called d3.js for uh, geographic coordinate manipulation. Um, we're using the Web Audio API uh, for 3D positional sound. So you can actually like zoom in on Big Ben and hear it chiming. But as you zoom out, it doesn't. Um, we're using Node.js on the server for doing the data manipulation and real-time uh, functionality. And we're using other geospatial technologies like PostGIS um, and GeoJSON for manipulating the data before we start visualizing it. And we started at a very, very basic level. Like originally, this project was about uh, experimenting with these technologies and trying to recreate something like SimCity using, using web technologies. Um, so we originally started with just trying to put buildings uh, in 3D. So we started with the coordinates of the corners of these buildings that we got from uh, sources that I'll touch on in a moment. Um, and we just started by plotting those dots out. Um, and we were really, really excited when we saw this, even though it looks pretty pretty weird. Um, and very quickly we realized, OK, this is easier than we thought. So we joined up those dots and we made building outlines. Um, and at this point, uh, we were getting really, really excited. Um, and it was at, at this point where we sort of realized, OK, this is genuinely possible. This is just in one evening. And then we extruded out those outlines into 3D. So we now had uh, 3D buildings of a city, which is London in this example, um, created in WebGL using free open data that we put together in a, a few hours in one evening. Um, and we, we thought this was really, really cool, but we didn't want to stop there. Like This was just the beginning of what we wanted to do. So one of the things we... Uh, use uh, the platform for is to overlay live data. So this is an example using uh, live tweets in London. Um, and each of the blue blue sort of blocks is a, a tweet or a fort or a balloon that sort of floats out of wherever it happened within the city. Visualizing tweets in real time isn't a new thing. Visualizing tweets in real time in 3D and visualizing that in a way that doesn't seem like a gimmick is interesting. Um, Creating that was pretty cool. Um, and you can do that with any other real-time data as well. We also wanted to look at visualizing uh, historic uh, static data. So for example, this is um, population density taken from uh, the uh, last census. Um, sorry, uh, taken from the Office for National Statistics. Um, so with this, we can experiment with things like using traditional visualization techniques like bar charts and uh, choropleths, which are basically heat maps, um, and allowing you to see in 3D within the context of a city, uh, where are the hotspots, um, where do things need improving, and all that kind of stuff. We're also looking at using AI um, to create things like real-time traffic flow analysis. Uh, visualizing buses in real time, um, and just visualizing other transport information using data we already have, like road networks. Um, now, before I move on to the next thing, who here traveled today on the tube? OK, pretty much everyone, which is good. So hopefully, you'll like the next thing. Um, we also recreated the London Underground in 3D. Uh, not only that, we created it with real-time trains as well. Now. This is just one example of how we're visualizing large-scale 
citywide data in new and interesting ways. Like this stuff just simply hasn't been done before. The data's existed, the technology has kind of existed, but for some reason people haven't been putting these things together um, and experimenting with what comes as a result of that. And it completely changes the way you look at the data and you look at the cities. Um, I mean, we were incredibly impressed when we, cr we created this and the result that came from it. After the first month, uh, we released our first development diaries, basically following up um, what we'd done so far, sharing our knowledge with other people. Um, within hours, we were number one on Hacker News, and I think we were on there for an entire day. Uh, we had 26,000 views to that blog post. 3,500 people signed up to our newsletter just to hear more about what we're up to. We were completely blown away. Okay, we were. Um, so hopefully that gives you a bit of an introduction um, into kind of where we've come from, a bit of a project overview. Um, and now, uh, alongside this, we also, what we're hoping to do here today is hopefully inspire you to actually go away and actually start to look at some of these uh, technologies um, because what you can do with them is absolutely amazing. They're incredibly powerful. Uh, we want to see more exciting projects bridging the gap between web technologies and the real world uh, using big data because fundamentally you can solve the world's big challenges doing exactly that. Uh, so to help, we thought we'd share um, three lessons um, on what we've learned over the last few months um, and hopefully um, in order to help you as you go start uh, looking and experimenting uh, with these technologies. Cool. So lesson number one. Uh, Big data is a big pain. Uh, we learned that very quickly. We started out with buildings, um, as I was mentioning. It was, the mo it was the first thing we wanted to experiment with. It was the most interesting. Um, and it was the most exciting challenge re regarding data. Like, where is it? Um, can you get it for free? And how accurate is it? So. One of the first places we found was Ordnance Survey. Um, most people have probably heard of Ordnance Survey, whether they did geography at school, using like orienteering and stuff like that, or actually using their data today. Um, the good thing about Ordnance Survey is they give away a lot of their data for free. So we could get building outline data for the whole of the UK for free. However, it's slightly inaccurate. Um, the building outlines are very uh, basic. Um, the O2 Arena is basically a splodge that doesn't look anything like the O2 Arena. Um, some of the building outlines are actually sliced. So in this example, you can see one little building that's actually cut into four because Ordnance Survey don't think about people using the actual outlines. They just think about visualizing it on their Ordnance Survey grid system. Um, so they never actually inter expected people to use the data in this way, as in getting an entire building in one go. So we had to do a lot of post-processing work just to use this data. There was also no heights, so we actually had no idea how tall these buildings went, and that's kind of important when you're visualizing stuff in 3D. So uh, that example you saw at the beginning with the buildings rotating in London, the heights were actually just random. Um, every time you refreshed that, they changed, but no one noticed. Um, but one of the good things about this, particularly with the basic outlines, was that the performance was really good. So we didn't really have to do much, and we could render a very big city because the buildings were very basic. In comparison, uh, we also looked at OpenStreetMap, which is a fantastic resource for geographic information. Now, most people know of OpenStreetMap as just a 2D mapping platform, but you can actually access all of the vector data about uh, uh, all of these geographic uh, objects, so buildings, natural features, everything like that. You can actually get the raw data, and you can turn that into whatever you want, into 3D. It's free. Um, it's way more accurate than Ordnance Survey. Um, the accuracy sort of varies, but it's definitely much more accurate. It's constantly updated and improved by a huge community of people. Um, it also has some heights. Now, the buildings in red are an example we produced a few weeks ago um, from Ordnance Survey, not Ordnance Survey, OpenStreetMap. Red buildings are the ones that actually have accurate height data included in the, in, uh, in the data. The blue ones are buildings that have floor numbers, so the level of floors that it has, um, some sort of estimation of how tall a building is that we can then manually convert into a idea of how high it is. Um, and everything else is either a best guess based on the type of the building which you can get access to as well. Um, the problem is that because of the detail, as you can see with the Houses of Parliament, there's a lot of performance problems that we have to overcome because you're rendering a lot more information even though it looks better. 
um, which was a big problem for us. Now roads, on the other hand, were slightly easier than buildings to gather. Um, Ordnance Survey have a, a wide road network um, for free that you can use, so we were using this for that artificial intelligence example I showed you. OpenStreetMap as well have highly accurate road data, which you can pull out um, and do whatever you want with, but that data was sometimes too detailed for our needs. So what we learned is that a lot of times we don't actually need uh, incredible detail. We can sometimes just use the most basic one. And natural features as well was the last major sort of non-statistical data source that we needed uh, to render London. Ordnance Survey again, uh, it's useful for smaller sort of uh, less detailed features like rivers and lakes and stuff like that. Um, OpenStreetMap had incredible coverage for natural features. I'm, I'm not sure where they got it from exactly, but it was much better than Ordnance Survey. Um, and it's in quite high detail as well. Interestingly, uh, OpenStreetMap was a much better source for rendering things like the river. Um, OpenStreetMap actually rendered the river in one object, which is kind of what a river is. Uh, Ordnance Survey had their grid system and they would sliced the river into loads of tiny pieces and it was just horrible to stitch back together. And another issue that we found with the data uh, is that it's just in, in many, many, many different formats that are unrelated to each other. So for example, uh, a lot of government data is provided in Excel spreadsheets, which aren't the most exciting thing in the world. Uh, and geospatial data can be provided in things like shapefiles, uh, ArcGIS format, uh, GeoJSON, or something else entirely that you have never expected before. Um, the point being that there's just no consistency to that data. And combining all that data can be a long and arduous process. And when making the live 3D uh, underground demo, um, we had to deal with a lot of problems. Something like, uh, well, for example, all the data we needed was hidden away in various places. So the depth data for all the stations was actually hidden away in a freedom of information request that some random person had filed uh, like a year ago. And it was never publicized in any way. You just had to kind of Google for it and dig through everything. And oh, look, there's the depth data hidden away in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, the data was provided in different formats. So the depth data was in that Excel spreadsheet the station positions was in another spreadsheet somewhere else that didn't quite connect with the same uh, data from the, the depths. Um, we had to manually merge all of this data together. We spent countless evenings like manually working out which station was connected to which depth and putting it together into a, a format that we could actually use on the web. And the TFL API, uh, the TFL API. <laughs> so the TFL API is very, very interesting, very powerful, but it's slightly broken. It's unreliable. Um, it's in XML, which isn't the most sort of suitable format for the web. It's verbose. Uh, it's complex. Um, and there were a lot of quirks, like trains that were going to stations that didn't exist, or trains that were somehow traveling at warp speed because TFL couldn't be bothered to put an error message, or some method of telling you when a train isn't actually going anywhere. Um, Everybody who tried to use this API has hit these problems. So if you use big data, there's a few sort of uh, key lessons to learn from this. Um, one is that expect multiple formats um, and prepare to do manual conversion. Um, hopefully this will get better as governments and people start using this data and start making a fuss about how it's in stupid formats that no one can use. Uh, two, expect it not to be perfect. Um, for example, the ordnance survey stuff is slightly uh, basic in the outlines and stuff like that, but it's usable. If you use open street maps, you not everything's going to have a height. You're going to have problems with performance because it's actually too detailed. Um, and free, it's hard work, but it's worth it. So uh, yeah, OK, you might have to do some manual conversion, but the results are going to be really powerful. The second lesson, um, the one we kind of didn't really expect to come across was cities are really big. Um, kind of obvious, but let me continue. Um, when we started Visi Cities, the aim was to visualize cities in their entirety. So while this was a good idea, we found uh, that this approach had a lot of problems. For example, where does a city end? Um, does it even have a quantifiable boundary? So we had trouble defining where London ended, for example. Is it at the edges of the London boroughs uh, or the areas that London transport serves? Uh, is it the area within the M25? Uh, 
Or is it the area within the surrounding counties? We, we couldn't quantify what London was. Um, and each approach had its problems. Um, for example, Kingston is within Surrey, but it's also a London borough, and it's served by London Transport. Um, however, it's incredibly far from what we define as the city um, of London, not the actual place, but the city in its entirety. So if we class Kingston as part of London, then we would have to render an absolutely humongous geographical area um, containing many, many thousands of buildings and geographical objects and all sorts of other stuff, which was just nearly impossible. So we attempted to look at this. We tried to do it. Um, we wanted to see what we could achieve at least. Um, we looked at a variety of approaches to improve performance, which was obviously the major bottleneck. So this is us trying to render a huge number of boroughs in London. Um, and we tried to batch the city into a grid system. Um, so we could use techniques like um, fustrim calling, which basically allows you to forget about objects that are not within the screen. Um, this increased performance incredibly, but when you wanted to see the entire city, everything just ground to a halt. We also looked at using things like level of detail. Um, so this is a technique to make far away objects less accurate um, and make them easier to render. So in our case, this helped a lot because all the buildings really far away, you didn't really want to see anyway, and they were quite sort of uh, basic, and you're not going to be able to understand what's going on. So we just made them incredibly uh, basic, like some blocks, basically. And this was a massive improvement on performance, but it still wasn't perfect because we were only visualizing part of London at this point. We weren't actually rendering the entire thing, or at least what we thought was the entire thing. So we, we did some creative thinking, um, and we came up with a much different approach, and that was to use a plinth. Um, and this plinth was basically like a magnifying glass looking at a defined 8 kilometer by 8 kilometer square area. It solved a lot of problems. Um, we didn't have to render the entire city in one go. Um, the simpler approach uh, allowed us to sort of um, make things a lot easier to understand for people and a lot easier to comprehend. Um, it solved a lot of performance problems at the same time. Like we could do much more of this area than we could with the entirety of London um, and not worry about um, how it's going to run. But it introduced a few other problems like how to navigate the city in this way. Like how do I get to whatever's outside of the plinth? Um, but these kind of problems were solvable with more creative thinking, which is kind of what Pete and I specialize in and why we started in this project in the first place. So to round up kind of what we learned from the cities are big thing, um, cities are amorphous. Like, where do they end? Um, that was something we were surprised by um, and something that completely changed our way of thinking. You can't render everything and don't expect to render everything. Think of ways to be creative, to improve performance in ways um, that are much simpler than just trying to render everything and then working out how to make that fast. Maybe there's a much better way um, that's just fast in general. And just think creatively, like with the approaches, like we did with the plinth and the interaction methods. Um, you'd be surprised at what you can come up with when you, you, you cast aside what other people are doing and think of a new way to create something. So I think I'm just going to go back one slide, actually. So one thing that kind of came about um, from this, from this potential problem we were had to having to deal with with performance, was actually something far better than we actually even expected. So we were having to deal with performance, and therefore we were having to think about how do we limit the amount that we're showing at any one time. So we came up with this plinth. And what we realized was that actually this, as a solution, gave us more opportunities to do even more uh, with the data that we had. So this would actually now actually allow us to start exploding out this plinth and visualizing what's underground, um, as well as kind of what's on the ground, and fundamentally as well, what's in the air. Cities are three-dimensional beings. Uh, they exist uh, in the sky, uh, within buildings, on the ground, and below the ground. Uh, so kind of uh, what could have been a, a potential problem actually resulted in something which is unlocking uh, more solutions for us. So, uh, on to the final lesson, uh, and the final lesson is just distrust uh, convention. So, I'm a designer, um, and uh, as uh, designers, um, convention is brilliant. Um, convention uh, is a shorthand uh, that we can use in the products and services that we create um, that can allow the, the users we're designing for to better understand uh, and therefore more quickly use uh, what we have created for them. Um, however, uh, if we only 
only ever rely on convention uh, in what we create. Um, we don't uh, allow room to foster uh, better, uh, more intuitive or more effective solutions to those to which we are already accustomed. Uh, so innovation uh, starts with a, a natural distrust of convention and a, a desire to make smarter, more intuitive and more effective uh, solutions. Um, so by dealing with uh, three dimensions uh, on the web, this has allowed us to kind of rethink the conventions um, that we employ every day when we think about navigating in space, when we think about navigating in a 2D mapping environment, quite naturally we're going to sit down in front of a map and we're going to know how to use it. When we're dealing with 3D space, this is an opportunity for us to now think not only about just taking the conventions that we're used to uh, and applying that to a 3D environment, but thinking about interactions, thinking about gestures and thinking about ways that you can um, uh, manipulate cities that are, are more natural and more intuitive for 3D um, than simply kind of copying and pasting the ones that we've already used for, for two dimensions. Um, and this kind of uh, thinking um, is great because it allows you to solve um, some great problems and kind of foster uh, more effective solutions, but it also just allows you to have a lot of fun as well. Uh, it allows you just to experiment, see what's possible. Um, and so just to kind of demonstrate, hopefully, um, the result uh, of some just uh, kind of fun thinking. Uh, Rob hacked this together kind of half an hour before uh, we came on today, so we're hoping it's going to work. Um, anyone here heard of a leap motion? A leap motion, only a couple of you. Okay, so the best way to understand a leap motion uh, is think about the film uh, Minority Report or Avatar, or even just think about your Kinect that you've got at home, right? Uh, the leap motion is a new product that just came out very recently uh, and allows you to um, control your computer uh, using uh, kind of 3D gestural, um, 3D gestural actions. Uh, so Rob is now controlling uh, this kind of six kilometer square, I'm gonna get out of the way, six kilometer square uh, of London using his hand. I don't know if you wanna turn and just face your body out, Rob, so everyone can see. Yeah. Um, and he's, he's manipulating the 3D space by using his hand in 3D space. So he's actually kind of pulling in and zooming into the city. He's actually able to spin it round. Um, so by just being uh, prepared to uh, just experiment uh, with new ways of interacting, we're able to do some really, really fun stuff. So I just wanna encourage you don't settle for what people have done before. Don't settle for convention, but just try things and see what's possible because there's new technologies and new exciting ways of looking at things coming out uh, all the time. What you're going to see then, again, is actually th this is live tweets right now. Uh, the video we were showing you before was a, a video kind of a, of a few days ago. This is right now, live tweets in London. Uh, we are kind of somewhere down bottom right maybe right now in the O2. There, uh, <laughs> there we are. Um, and these are actually live tweets that are coming out of London right now, tweets that have been geotagged. Um, so these are just some of the fun, not uh, definitely not the most useful um, <laughs> kind of uses for what we've created, but just some of the fun ones uh, that allow you to start thinking, well, actually, what if we were to not just display, I don't know, tweets on a map as a pin? What if we were to have them like little balloons setting off um, up above the city? So the lesson here, the lesson here really is to just distrust convention. Convention is fantastic. It allows users to understand very quickly how to use what we've created, uh, but fundamentally will never move, will only ever move incrementally. Um, by, starting, um, by starting to question convention, you're able to um, rethink interactions right the way through to the way that you can actually interact with a web page and hopefully therefore foster more creative solutions. So hopefully that's been some really uh, useful lessons for you. Um, it'd be good now just to discuss kind of what's next uh, for the project. So we started this a few months ago, um, but we are uh, now uh, talking um, with organizations all over the world um, and uh, they are working with us because um, they see and we believe that we can fundamentally help them completely re-understand their data and provide new context for it, um, which is absolutely fantastic. And it's a real privilege um, to be part of this. Um, so what's next for the actual platform? Well, the answer is uh, we need you. Um, so we uh, are looking to talk with people uh, who, uh, like those uh, behind me, um, are um, looking to make more informed decisions by visualizing their data, their buildings, their infrastructure uh, in three dimensions. Um, we also want to talk to people about um, uh, funding, uh, people who will be looking uh, to either
either fund or sponsor uh, new technologies uh, like this one. Uh, and finally, we also want to talk to people uh, who are just interested in these kind of technologies. Things like uh, WebGL uh, and the 3JS library. We'd love to give you some pointers, some tips, send you resources, whatever it is you need please feel free to contact us. We'd love to help you because we want to see amazing stuff being produced by you guys um, as well. We want to see real world solutions being brought about by combining web technologies with your smart minds. So the way to do that is just to uh, drop us an email, speak to us after this presentation. Um, you can tweet us. Um, you can also sign up for the beta as well. We have a beta program running. Um, it's going to be uh, kind of uh, something we're, we're working towards. If you'd like early access to that beta, then feel free to head over to VisiCities.com. You can just fill in your email address there, um, and we'll kind of keep you up to date with things, but also give you early access uh, to the project. Um, that's about it as far as I'm concerned. Um, so we're trying to bring real world cities to life uh, using the power of the web. I've been Pete Smart, this has been Rob Hawks, and uh, thank you very much for your time. Yep. And we, we would love to open the floor up to any questions. Someone must have won. Super. If you have any questions, <laughs> uh, if you're too embarrassed to ask now, feel free to come and talk to us afterwards. Uh, we'd love to talk to you. All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs>